we need then the graphical representation of the temperature distribution. Uh, the temperature distribution is usually represented through through false color map. As you can see, uh, here we have some relevant information on the anatomy and the physiology of this subject. In the visible band, you cannot appreciate the temperature of the muscles that are controlling the head movement. You cannot appreciate the uh, activation of the anti-inflammatory glands, for example. And you can see, like here, uh, the activity of the muscle and muscle that is involved in uh, crunching. If you search on the internet, you will find uh, plenty of uh, thermography images. Uh, this is because uh, thermography is not new at all. It has been used in medicine since uh, 60s and 70s. But uh, the camera, the thermal camera that we uh, that were used at that time, were really, really, um, how I can say, naive. Uh, the temperature resolution, the temperature sensitivity, is, was very, very low. The main application in the past of uh, medical thermography was early, detect early detection of breast cancer. The basic idea was, okay, if I have tumor here, then there will be a set of uh, new vessels that are feeding the tumor growth. These vessels will be hyperthermal. So if I find here an hyperthermal spot, that will be an indicator of the presence of the tumor. As you can easily understand, this is a too easy approach. What we have to keep in mind that with thermography, we can just measure cutaneous temperature. We cannot measure the temperature of body portions that are under the skin layer. This is the first remark that you have to keep in mind. Because of this, thermography has been basically abandoned by the medical community. So it's very tough to find a thermal camera in hospital, even in the Western country. But we are lucky in this perspective because the technical advancement has brought the development of a new thermal camera. So for example, this is one of the modern thermal camera images we caught in our lab that is showing how the body regulates the skin temperature during exercise. You can appreciate here the uh, very high spatial resolution and the very high temperature sensitivity. That is, these new cameras have the capability to detect even subtle temperature radiation, as low as 200 of degree. Moreover, this camera can record over time. So we can monitor and follow up all of the skin thermoregulatory processes. And if I can find in this thermoregulatory process, and I can use this information that is the way the thermal regulation is applied in order to understand whether that process is normal, abnormal, or not. So just some elements of physics. What we use is the thermal radiation that is emitted by the bodies. Each body, which has a temperature different from zero degree, emits radiation, electromagnetic radiation in infrared spectrum. The infrared spectrum is very close to the baseball spectrum. In particular, the wavelength of the electromagnetic emission is between 2.5 and 100 micrometers. The human body emits most of its thermal radiation in this long wavelength band. It is from 7 to 15 micrometers. So our detectors, thermal detectors, have to work in this range. We are familiar with infrared imaging. Uh, weather forecasts are based on thermal imaging. 
taken by the satellite or even in astronomy or in security. You should know that thermal imaging has been the moment for military purposes in order to search for enemies during the night, basically. Uh, and thermal imaging is largely used in non-destructive testing. This is a um, mechanical part of an engine that is operating because of a normal friction. This is a, a roof where there is uh, some water fluctuation, uh, and this is an arm where you can pitch in the vessels. Uh, just to say that it is largely used now in medicine. So let's uh, have some recall about the physics of radiation. With radiation, we refer to the continual emission of energy from the source. Here we talk about thermal radiation. The thermal imaging systems are non-contact uh, devices, and they sense the radiation that uh, appears to emanate from the surface. Why I'm saying that appears? Because uh, the Physics law, as you know, have been the global for theoretical model. Here, the theoretical model is the black body radiation, which is a body that is able to emit and collect all the thermal radiation at each level. Real bodies do not act as black bodies. So we, have, we can just measure appearance temperature, and we have to correct this appearance temperature to the real temperature through some correction happening. The energy that is emitted by the body depends, therefore, upon the surface temperature and surface characteristics. These surface characteristics are measured by a parameter that is called body emissivity. The black body, the theoretical body, has an emissivity um, that is equal to 1, 100%. All the other bodies, they are called green bodies, have a lower emissivity. So human skin, for example, as an emissivity of 0.98, which is very close to the theoretical emissivity of one for the method. If we measure the amount of energy per unit of surface over second at different set temperatures, we will get these cars. These curves are in a linear representation as a function of the spectral radiance uh, of the wavelength. The Max Planck law can tell us at the, which is the spectral characteristic of each body at given temperature. So what you can see here is that, that at, as I increase the temperature, I will provide the greater energy, that is greater power to the thermal emission. Each body has, at a different temperature, a specific wavelength where the emission is uh, um, the most powerful. The global amount of energy that is emitted is measured by the Stefan Boltzmann law and is proportional to the fourth power of absolute temperature. What it means? It means that the small temperature variation will provide a large variation of the emitted energy, amount of emitted energy. Another relevant point is the following. If you look at this graph, you will see that as the temperature increases, the wavelength where I have the maximum of the emission will be um, lower. This is the V no. It means that as the temperature increases, the wavelength of the maximum emission will be shorter. Therefore, if I want to measure the thermal radiation from human body, and human body is around 300 Kelvin, basically, from this law, I have to search between 7 and 14 micrometers for the maximum radiation. So my detector has to be, uh, have to has the, the major sensitivity in this narrow wavelength band. We already talked about emissivity. So basically, the emissivity is the fraction between the actual emission and the theoretical emission 
keeping all of the other conditions fixed, it is temperature of the body, surface of the body. And here we have a table of the emissivity for several materials. As I said, the idea of black body has emissivity equal to one, human skin is very close, so basically we can just apply the basic physics law without any correction. While all, other, all the other materials have lower emissivity. Uh, the lower the emissivity, the higher the reflectivity in terms of uh, thermoradiation. So if I have a body that emits this uh, radiation at the given temperature, uh, I have to find a detector that is able to measure all of this amount of energy and applying in the inverse mode, the Stefan Boltzmann mode, the, the, the system has to compute at which theoretical temperature that amount of energy is emitted. But the detectors are not sensitive over the whole infrared band. It means that I have sensors that are sensitive just from 3 to 5 micrometers, or just from 7 to 10, or 7 to 14. So basically, I cannot capture all of this amount of energy, but just a fraction of it. And this fraction comes from the contribution between the sensor spectral detectivity, it's a parameter that measures the amount of thermal radiation recorded at the given women and the global amount of energy emitted by the body. What it means? It means that uh, if I have this specific thermal radiation, it's not wise to search for a detector that works in this band. But it's better to search for the detector that work in this narrow map. The detector is the heart of the imaging system, and it converts the infrared radiation into a measurable, measurable electrical signal. Of course, this uh, uh, happens through a series of uh, processing units. So uh, I have to first to focus the thermal radiation on the detector. Then I have to uh, read the output of the detector and to control the readout circuitry in order to provide uh, an output that is a simple voltage that can be mapped into pseudo colors to a lot cup table. So basically what I'm measuring is just a voltage that is a function of the temperature of the body. This voltage depends on the radiation from the target, depends on the detector responsivity, as I told is the parameter that, that the function that, that tells me how that specific kind of sensor detects the thermal radiation. And it depends on the geometry of the optics of the camera and the capability of the camera to control the signal to noise ratio. So basically, this is a parameter that is provided by the, uh, the, camera, uh, the camera manufacturer. In the past, we had just one single sensor system that was scanning the field of view through a mechanical scanning system. Uh, this kind of camera are cheaper because you have just one thermal detector. And uh, have also the convenience of being highly calibrated because you have to calibrate just one sensor of time. But, uh, they are very, very slow in scanning the full field of view. For this reason, today, modern systems use focal plane array of detectors. So basically, you have uh, 
up to 1,024 1,024 hectares arranged like uh, in a visible uh, photo camera, CCD photo camera, that simultaneously record the time of radiation. This increases the time resolution of the acquisition. We are able now to apply up to 150 full frames per second. Of course, the electronic is much more complicated. The cost is much more elevated than in the previous case. We have two families of detectors. They are called the so-called cooled or uncooled detectors. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that uh, I can measure the thermal radiation from another body only if I have a temperature that is lower than the temperature of the other body. Because as you know, heat propagates from higher temperature body to lower temperature body. So the lower the temperature of the detector, the higher the amount of energy that is uh, sensed as energy emitted by the high temperature body. For this reason, I have to keep the detectors at very low temperature. This will increase the amount of energy, but also it will improve the signal towards pressure. For this reason, the good camera are cooled camera, and the detector usually work at 70, 70, uh, 77 Kelvin. So I have a specific cryogenic cooling uh, with the liquid nitrogen, and this is one of the most expensive parts of the camera because uh, the, this uh, kind of cooler may cost up to $25,000, $30,000 in the FBA system. The cheaper camera use an cooled system, and cooled detector, sorry. What it means? It means that they can work at room temperature, but of course they are not at the room temperature. Otherwise, they will be in thermal equilibrium with the environment. So they are basically at the temperature that is around zero Kelvin. Here the cooling is achieved by a, a thermoelectric cooler. We don't use liquid nitrogen. So these are very cheaper in comparison with these coolant selectors. This is a, a, an example of modern infrared imaging system. Actually, this is uh, uh, sold by Freer. Freer is the, probably the, the largest uh, seller of different cameras around the world. Uh, this is uh, a bolometer camera. It means it's an uncooled camera. As a, a photon plane array of 640 uh, by uh, 480 detectors, it works between minus 10 and 150 Celsius centigrade. It works in the spectral range from 7 to 14 micrometers, so it's perfect for human body, basically. And it has a, a temperature sensitivity uh, as low as 0 0.05 centigrade. And you can bring it in a, in a like a visible car. It just uh, the weight is just a couple of kilos. Basically, the optics is a special optics that is a highly transparent to infrared radiation, of course. Uh, the whole system actually is sold for uh, fifty thousand dollars, more or less. So, what we can do with this kind of camera? In the past. Thermal imaging applied to the human body was only used in order to detect thermal asymmetries of the body. So the basic idea was, okay, here everything should be symmetric. So I see here never thermal spot, here there's something wrong. That was the basic idea. You can easily understand that with this new generation of camera. It's better to follow up all of the thermoregulatory processes and try to model from a mathematical and biophysical point of view these thermoregulatory processes. 
So my eternal analysis would be just highlight at uh, highlighting uh, temperature asymmetries in the temperature distribution of the human body. But I will be able to obtain from the temperature versus time curves some quantitative parameters that I can use for diagnosis. So this is the new idea. Uh, so basically, if I cool down the hands of the subject, and if I measure the temperature in a given region of interest, like uh, the neighbor here, how we get these uh, temperature versus time curves, these uh, curves can be modeled from a different approach automatic control system approach, for example, bioheat exchange approach, or simply mathematical fitting. So I can extract parameters, and I can use these quantitative parameters for differential balances. This approach is what we call functional infrared imaging. What we can study with this approach of course, everything that is expressed at the skin level in terms of outward thermoregulation. So basically, microcirculation, some microcirculatory problems, tissue degeneration, impaired sympathetic activity like in diabetic food, for example, metabolism and physical activity, plus some innovative application like assistant to surgery and as I told, neuropsychology. In this way, I now to present shortly uh, several of these applications. So you can get an idea. I won't go into detail from the clinical point of view, neither from mathematical point of view. Uh, I put a reference, uh, paper reference, that you can download from our website if you are interested in it. My, uh, my goal now is just to make you curious about this topic. Okay? So, for example, uh, it appears that in this lab, there is nothing strange. This is a subject in standing position. But if I cool down this region, it means if I ask the thermoregulatory process to work against the, an external stimulus, look what happens. This is going down. And you can see that uh, at the end of the process, I can visualize these vessels when there is an interruption of the flow. This is a case of deep vein thrombosis. Deep vein thrombosis is a disease uh, relatively frequent. So all I can capitalize on this. I've seen that where I have the problem, I have a faster recovery from the thermal stress with respect to the surrounding health region. So if I compute, for example, the time constant of this recovery process, and if I can obtain a parametric image where I am now representing pixel to pixel after having correct the thermal series of image from movement artifact, of course, I'm um, displayed here the time constant pixel to pixel. So basically, the shorter the time constant, the faster the thermal recovery. If I check with echocolor Doppler system this region, I find the train thrombosis. This is just a, an example of the way we can use this approach. Uh, Another disease we have uh, studied for a long time is varicocele. Varicocele is a dilatation of the venous plexus of the scrotum and uh, of the internal spermatic vein. Uh, what is the consequence of this disease? It's uh, uh, an increased reflux of blood in the, scrot in the scrotum. This leads to an increase of the scrotal temperature. Uh, the increase in scrotal temperature reduces fertility. In West countries, this is the first cause of uh, reduced fertility. Up 40% of male population suffers from this kind of problem. 
So if I use thermal imaging, it's very easy to detect hyperthermal region where the region increases the blood reflux. But, of course, this is still a, a static approach. I can say, okay, look, there is an hyperthermal region, go with the Nico Doppler system and try to assess what is providing this hyperthermal. But uh, if we again cool down the scrotum and we look at the recovery curves, we can again use the time constant of the recovery curves in order to assess how severe is the problem, basically. And this is what I've done, or what we have done. Moreover, if you, uh, if you repair the problem, either by surgical interpretation or harder technique, you can easily assess to thermal infrared imaging if the problem, whether the problem has been solved or not. Here the problem is completely solved. As you can see, there are no temperature asymmetries and the thermal recovery between contralateral sides of the scrotum is perfectly symmetric. Here the problem has not been solved. Okay, we are not uh, physicians, uh, so what we can do with that? Basically, what we are proposing to do is to use uh, the theory of automatic control process uh, in order to compute the transfer function of this thermoregulatory process. With that, we, we got uh, a set of four functional parameters and the combination of these parameters allows for an highly accurate um, diagnosis of so basically what we are doing now in our hospital is to use this approach in order to assess the severity of the disease and to establish whether the dead patient has to go under surgery or not. If, it, if what I'm saying is too, uh, too much, uh, what is a too long descriptive, I can, I can go in further details, you know? Okay, another application is uh, as an imaging assistance in surgery. Uh, why we can use thermal imaging in surgery? Because uh, we, we can provide some information about, about blood perfusion in tissues to the surgeons without interfering with this activity. This activity. Here, uh, this, is an inter this is a surgery for harm implantation. As you can see, I am far away from the operatory band, uh, and uh, here I'm, I'm uh, keeping my work. And this is a finger representation. So the hand here is very cold because uh, the whole heart has been, um, the, the blood circulation in the whole heart has been stopped in order to fire the surgery. When I move this, uh, this band that stops the blood flow, of course, the hand rewards. And here you can see this uh, white spot. That is the thermal track of uh, blood leakage from the digital artery. So before that, the surgeon closes the, the tissue, he can check whether the anastomosis of the vessels have been provided perfectly or not. This is extremely important. And uh, we use it also for heart transplant and coronary bypass surgery. Um, you know that uh, there are situations where the coronary, which are the arteries that uh, feed the heart basically, do not work properly because they are, because they are um, fill it with the, with the, let's say, fat. So this is a, a region of the artery. Of, of, of course, this is a open thorax surgery. That's why I'm, I can see the heart using the thermal camera. So uh, using the thermal camera, I can see that there is a cold region here. This region is cold because the coronary, this one, is not providing uh, the right amount of blood. 
Uh, just over here, here is the head of the patient. Here is the vertex of the heart. And what they can record, actually, we did with the Harvard Heart System. Okay, this is the beating heart. This kind of surgery can be either performed with beating the heart or stop the heart in extra, uh, extra body circulation. In our hospital, they do perform this kind of surgery in, uh, with the beating heart technique which is much more difficult, but it's later for the patient. So basically, what we can do with thermal imaging? Uh, the surgery uh, works in this way. This is the left descending mammary artery that is uh, detached from the, 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 the breast and is brought to the heart in this position to bypass the obstruction in the coronary artery. So that uh, the, 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 the muscle will be fitted by this new artery and not longer from the previous one. So this is the left ascending mammary artery. It's, it is cold because it's cold because it, it, the blood flow here is stopped. So you will see now the surgeon that will remove the graft that stops the blood flow. And you will see here the tiny hyperthermal tract that is blood leakage from the anastomosis. You have to keep in mind that you can see this kind of things by the eye. This uh, tiny blood leakage is dramatic because here the pressure, the arterial pressure is very high. And this, uh, uh, this is may need to recall the patient in the surgery room within the, 40, uh, the following 48 hours after the surgery. So if you can fix the problem before the close the patient, I guess it's better. So let's see what happens. OK. The surgeon is alternating the thanastomosis. Now we will remove the graft right now. Look here. This drug here yeah, that goes with the bit is the blood leakage. So it needs to be fixed. What we are trying to do now is to compute how much blood I'm carrying into the, the muscle in, in the surrounding regions through bioheat modeling. It's a very tough problem because you have to, first of all, you have to compute it in real time. You can't have two hours of processing time or with it patient open in the subdivision. But uh, if you look at videos, mm -hmm. sorry. There is dramatic movement here. Dramatic change of perspective. So the image processing problem is very, very tough. And once I solve the image processing problem, I have to solve the bioweight transfer problem in real media. It's a very tough problem. And I don't think the solution is that good. OK. These uh, images are from neurosurgery. Uh, these, are, these pictures have been taken at NIH. So basically, there is a tumor here. Uh, you know that before neurosurgery, the patients undergo to a series of the functional investigation, of the functional MRI, MEG, EEG. So there is a pre-surgical mapping of the cortex activities in order to anticipate to the patient that the removal of the tumor will be safe and all of his heart capabilities will be not affected or there will be need for some rehabilitation of these kind of things. By the way, during the surgery, when you open the the patient is uh, um, is uh, awakened uh, from the anesthesia, and there is this um, intrasurgical mapping of the cortical uh, brain. And uh, uh, this uh, intrasurgical mapping is done by EEG, so they put some electrodes in the brain, and they measure the cortical activity. But uh, if you measure the chamber, for example, for language activation, uh, you can uh, easily detect that the region is activated by that function. Because here it's like the ball signal MRI. It's, 
It's a, a hemodynamic regulation from the pool of neurons that are working for that purpose. So you can see that this helicoid region is far away from the tumor region. So you know that for this function, the removal of the tumor is a safe condition. Just some hints on another pathology that is a random phenomenon in Slovenia. Uh, this pathology is, is uh, frequent uh, in uh, cold countries. So probably you are lucky here. Yeah? <laughs> uh, what is the Lyman phenomenon? Uh, basically, you know that if I'm bringing something from the, from the fridge there, there will be a vasoconstriction of my finger yeah? as I'm touching something that is cold or as I put my hand in the cold bath. The same happens if uh, I am nervous or anxious. There is a vasoconstriction reaction. Now, it is physiological, this reaction. It is physiological that my hands get white because uh, of vasoconstriction. And if there is not a following vasodilatation, my hands will, will uh, get blue, channelic. After that, if my work if my body works properly, my hands will be red because of uh, um, hyperemic reaction. Well, people who suffer from Raymond's phenomenon exhibit these kind of reactions several times a day, even just touching a piece of hyper. In this kind of phenomenon, it's uh, extremely severe and painful for these people. Now there are two kinds of patients that uh, suffer from renal phenomenon. The hydropathic or primary renal patients, it means that uh, they have this problem, and this is uh, related to the way their vessels are organized. So there is nothing to do with that. But uh, if you keep your hand in a warm environment, you will never suffer from that. Or if you use vasodilatory, vasodilatory drugs, you can fix the problem. But this same phenomenon is exhibited that even 10 years before by people that can develop scleroderma. Scleroderma is a very important autoimmune disorder where the heart antibodies basically attack the connective tissue and destroy the connective tissue. The connective tissue is present in the arteries, in the lungs, in our mouth, in the heart. So if this uh, syndrome is uh, systemic, the, uh, the patient will die for that. In cold countries, four out of 1,000 people suffer from renal phenomenon. People who suffer from renal phenomenon in 10% of the cases will develop scleroderma. So basically, when a patient comes to our hospital, with the renal phenomenon, it's very important to assess whether it's a neuropathic process or it's the first sign of the scleroderma pathology. This is the evolution of the end with scleroderma. You can see that there is an increase of fibrosis in the tissue. So basically, it's like hood finger. Okay, it's a thermoregulatory problem. So what we did is, was just to evoke thermoregulatory process by cooling down, slightly cooling down the hands in normal population, in scleroderma population, you can see that there are differences between finger and finger, and in hydropathic renal population, where basically there is no recovery at all. You can see the temperature versus time curves, and you can easily recognize that I can model the scars with different mathematical functions or different bio transfer functions. This is what we did. I will mean, not go into detail. You can download the paper as I said. But basically what we have measured is the amount of it that is produced in the store at fingertip level. So basically the healthy population has these average values. This is for each finger. So this is one patient, the ten fingers of one patient, one healthy subject, the 10 fingers of scleroderma patients, the 10 fingers of uh, primary renal patients. This is the primary renal population, scleroderma population, healthy population. 
you can see that it's pretty easy, by a statistical point of view, to separate and discriminate this, uh, this situation. But uh, what we did was uh, to try to understand that, uh, of course, you can use thermal imaging in order to evaluate the effect of drug treatment. Uh, these patients are treated with uh, this kind of uh, drug, which is basically uh, the, 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 the drug that you take when you have the cock. It's, um, I don't know the English word. Uh, okay. It, it's it, to, uh, to stop your cock. Okay. 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 Uh, it is uh, um, administrator in venous infusion. It has a strong antioxidant effect and anti-inflammatory effect. But it, it is also a strong vasodilator. So you can see that just after one hour of administration, the speech electric increases by several degrees under the drug application. Uh, again, we use the uh, tower image method, it is the time recovery uh, the constant time constant recovery method in order to um, individuate which regions of the finger are the most damaged. And, you can, uh, and we use this kind of information in order to follow up the progression of the disease. And one more thing we did is the following. This is important also for psychometrics uh, applications. Okay, the skin temperature depends uh, on uh, a complex set of uh, parameters. We have the uh, thermal conductivity, we have the blood flow rate, we have the metabolic activity of the tissues, and so on. Among those, it is very important the blood flow rate. So, uh, if uh, I use the skin temperature as a boundary condition, and if I solve the inverse problem, I can compute the blood flow rate, at least uh, to a numerical uh, approach. This is what we have done. So from the thermal image, we can uh, obtain now the cutaneous blood flow images. The golden standard for this kind of uh, estimation is the laser dot blood imaging, where laser light scans the hands, and the Doppler effect associated with the red cells movement allows to compute the amount of blood that is circulating in the potential. But if you remember, I can acquire up 150 full frames in thermal imaging per second. So I can acquire 100, 149 of these potential blood flow images in one second. I can monitor this blood flow variation. The laser scanner takes four minutes to grab the whole picture. Four minutes for human bodies, it's a huge amount of time. It means that my physiological condition when I was scanning this region is completely different from the one that I had while I was scanning this other region. So what we did was to assess the correlation between the blood flow as estimated through thermal imaging, with the blood flow as measured with laser Doppler in small portion of tissues. You can see that our measurement, our estimated measurement through infrared imaging are in good agreement with the uh, laser Doppler observation in the healthy population. These are for healthy population. If I apply the same biofit model in scleroderma population, I lose any good correlation. What does it mean? Does it mean that my model is not appropriate? Or it means that uh, the biohit parameters, like thermal conductivity and so on, that I've used in my health population do not apply to the scleroderma population? This is the case. So if I correct this parameter, this population will behave like this. What does it mean? It means that I can measure some specific thermal capacity alteration in the scleroderma tissue. I can see if the drug treatment moves these parameters toward 
program values for the healthy population, and I can monitor the progression, the follow-up of the treatment. Again, it's a feedback control sampling system, so I can use the theory of automatic uh, control. Again, and compute transfer functions for this uh, temperature control. This is what we did. And uh, discrimination analysis works very, very well in order to separate the, diff the several cases of scleroderma, the primary phenomenon, and the population, and so on. So the basic uh, suggestions that uh, I want to bring is, OK, with thermal imaging, we, we can do a lot of things in trends. But we can do even more if we apply the physics and the math. So we can mo we model these functional responses. We have to focus not on the temperature. The temperature is just a boundary condition. We have to look inside the process. OK, so that was the first part of the talk. I guess you are tired. Uh, that was focusing on the functional input. I have to show now something that is uh, probably more appealing because uh, it can uh, it can revolutionize the way we we do some kind of things. So one of the goals in my lab and with a couple of other labs in the new world is to use infrared imaging to set up a mobile and modular contact free non invasive automatic system for monitoring neuropsychology, security, and treatment in healthcare. Think about it. I don't need contact between the sensors and the subject. So I can measure temperature at a distance. If I track properly the body's movement and the region of interest, I don't even have to ask the cooperation of the subject. So I can follow him while he's walking, for example, or while he's moving a thumb, or while he's moving in airport, for example, for signal screen. In fact, all of the methods uh, actually available are contact methods. Uh, so I can measure physiology, vital signs, but I have to be invasive. I have to put contact sensors. Uh, things about the heartbeat rate, for example, or the speed of rate. And uh, these systems are not suitable for sustaining 24 hours a day monitoring. Try to imagine yourself while working with uh, 25, 26 detectors attached to your body. They interfere with normal activity. They require subject cooperation. But, this is much more important, in neuropsychophysiology, they introduce bias. Because if I want to study the emotional reaction that gives stimulus, I want to measure it in the ecological context, in the natural context. But uh, if I am first to set up all the sensors and calibrate them and ask the subject, look, please stay still, otherwise the signal will be corrupted and so on, everything is gone. And you can understand that if we society, if we be successful in this, we will provide a new way to look at the sexual detection, you know, psychophysiology, psychometrics, non-verbal communication, study of emotions, human computer interface, plus some other uh, clinical application and so on. So. Why we can do that? Okay. The first thing is that we, you, we use thermal imaging of the face to do that. Because the face is always exposed to the communication. The temperature of the face depends on the muscular metabolic activity, cutaneous perfusion, vasomotor tone, peripheral vascular resistance, breathing function, pseudomotor function. All of these functions are controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So, if I will be able to understand in which way the sympathetic and parasympathetic, system, parasympathetic system, nervous systems activate these channels from measuring 
the dynamics of the facial temperature, I can recover information on the autonomic activity. And the autonomic activity is always on. Is the way our body controls our relationships with the environment and the stimuli that we receive. Uh, one of the most important reactions is the so-called flight or fight signal. It's a very hold response that we keep. It's controlled by the amygdala level. Basically, in front of the situation, I can choose only two uh, possible solutions. I can fight the situation or I can escape from the situation. In both cases, I need blood to my muscles in order to follow the action of the muscle. And this is, if to do that, I need to move the blood from the skin layers to the healing muscles. That's why when we are 